Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening and good morning for everybody else watching us. Um, today, uh, it's going to be a discussion about national dialogue in Sudan. And we have guests in, uh, with us here at the United States Institute for Peace. And we have oh. two percent participants through Skype. I'll make a quick introduction to our panelists today. We have Ambassador Mr. Lehman who is no stranger to Sudanese affairs. He was the former uh, special envoy to Sudan in 2011, and he is a senior advisor to the, to the president. We have Dr. Abdullahi Ali Ibrahim. He's an emirates professor of African history at the uh, University of Missouri. He had written many articles and books uh, about the religion and politics in Sudan specifically, and decolonization in Africa. We have Mr. Ahmed Hussein Adam. He's a visiting scholar uh, and a co-chair of the Two Sudan Forum at the Institute for Study of Human Rights at the University of Columbia. He's currently writing a book about the conflict in Darfur and the regional and international community uh, reaction to the conflict. And he's also an LLM uh, graduate from Westminster University in the UK. And we have, sorry. <laughs> We have Mr. Nasruddin Abdelbari, also a lawyer, graduate of Harvard, Harvard University with LLM in international uh, law and human rights. He had been uh, a consultant with Open Society Foundation and a senior researcher with um, Rift Valley Institute. And we have Mr. Medu Jazuli through Skype. Uh, he is um, a cur currently a scholar at Bern uh, Bern University in Germany, and he is a blogger and he conducts workshops about uh, Sudan and two, two Sudans actually and peace building. We have also Mr. Zaid Al Khatib through Skype. He is the director of, uh, of the Center for Strategic uh, Studies. He has been also a member of the negotiation, uh, presenting the Sudanese government in negotiations uh, before the referendum and with SPLM North. Last but not least, Mr. John Timmon. He's the director of the African program. He covers Sudan, South Sudan, and Somalia, including other sub-Saharan countries. His focus is conflict prevention and current um, uh, conflicts. I will just give a quick uh, um, notes about how we're going to discuss uh, this topic today. We, since we have people here in the in the room with us, they can uh, just let me know when they want to comment on a uh, and I want to point. For those who are with us through Skype, please let the control squad know and they will whisper in my ear and then I'll give you a chance. Uh, the topic of the discussion is uh, the national dialogue and political arrangements. Uh, it's gonna be in two parts. The first part is gonna be about the, uh, the national dialogue. Why now, why important, the type, the mechanism, the strategies, and who's gonna participate. And the second part is going to be about the security, uh, like about the challenges to the dialogue that includes security situation in Sudan, uh, political participation, and strategies of how to conduct the dialogue. Um, and after that, um, I will give, uh, without any further ado, I will ask uh, Ambassador Lyman to start the proceedings because he needs to leave early to attend a funeral of the second president of the USIP, Sam Lewis. So, Ambassador Lyman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank all of those who are participating in this uh, <coughs> dialogue. Let me start by saying that when I was in South Africa in the 1990s, I asked someone very close to President de Klerk, well, how is it that your government embarked upon this transitional process and negotiations with the ANC and all the changes? And he said that it was in the 1980s that the people at the top of the government came together and realized they could keep this up for a long time. They could probably keep up the apartheid system and ruling for another decade, but they knew they couldn't keep it up forever. So the question was, how could they move through a transition that protected them and their people and still uh, took, a, took account that the change had to come? And that led them first into secret negotiations with Nelson Mandela, and then unbanning all the opposition parties and into the transition to democracy in South Africa. And of course, in that transition, the people who had been in government and out and who had been, in many ways, the beneficiaries of the system actually came out well. They're doing well in South Africa. That's what democracy does, it allows for everybody to have an opportunity. 
in Sudan, the government can keep running Sudan as it has for a long time through a system of patronage, political control, uh, use of militias and military, et cetera, but it can't keep it up forever. And the cost of, con of running Sudan as it is now is very, very great. So the challenge, the question for the government and for everyone else is, how do you make this transformation? How do you take the steps that say, look, we can't keep this up forever. We have to make a major transformation. How do we do it? And the national dialogue, which has been talked about a great deal, is, of course, a means to start that process going. It's going to be complicated. It's going to be difficult. You have to define exactly what is meant by a national dialogue and who should participate. And then you have to decide, what is the authority of the dialogue? Is it a rulemaking? Is it a constitution writing? Is it an advisory group? All those issues have to be worked out, and then the process itself. I would just remind people that once the government in South Africa had made those decisions and opened up the process, it still took four years before the election in 1994 that finally brought about the end of apartheid and the democratic uh, liberation of South Africa. So this is a long process, but if the government and all the others are truly committed to a process that will lead to transformation, and a transformation that all Sudanese can not only participate but benefit from, then it can happen. And it can happen without more turmoil, without more conflict, and without more uh, suffering by the Sudanese people. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, the, I think of that point, I would like to move to Dr. Abdullah. You were one of the first people who ever suggested this during the first years of the government. I remember you had something called um, the creative fatigue. And it was written in Arabic, but I think you, how do you think things are similar since 2000? This is like a, a quarter of a century after writing that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the reason why I'm uh, kind of a little bit pessimistic about uh, the possibility of uh, doing a national dialogue uh, because uh, you know we don't want to get into the mistake of seeing dialogue as a good thing and a healthy thing and a, in, 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 in glamorous terms. In a, a national dialogue you are talking uh, speaking truth to a power uh, and that makes power uh, irritable. And, uh, and, and, and so we, we need to be very careful about, about how to present national dialogue. I, uh, 25 years ago, I was, I, was, I was basing my argument on that all the forces in the country uh, got fatigued. Uh, the culture of the Cold War, uh, in which most of these, most of the ideas of the parties and things like that were formulated. This culture was falling apart and disintegrating. And so people need to make these revisions. Uh, and that was a call. Uh, 25 years ago, I'm not sure if uh, the various forces made this recognition that they are out of the game or that their ide ideas are uh, so they talk about Thawabit, that the constant things, things that are established that they are not going to uh, give up on. And, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and there is no culture of forgive, forget, and forgive. And that is the, uh, as, 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 as the ambassador said, it is, you know, it, that is the kind of the underpinning of the, uh, of the creative dialogue in South Africa. Uh, I remember the time when people like religious people called ambassadors of Christ. We haven't had that luck so far in Sudan. And uh, p I saw people, people in Sudan making obituaries of Mandela and talking about his forgiveness and his uh, uh, wide perspectives while they are really 
uh, following a very narrow path in their own life and in their own practice. So uh, I'm just saying we really need to take national dialogue with a grain of salt. Great, thank you so much. We will go back again to the uh, question of accountability and building, building a trust because we, we, we will come across that. Let's go to Khartoum. Mr. Khatib, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Um, what do you say about that? What do you well, just I'll tell heard? You what I'll What's that? Yeah, go ahead. Finish your question, please. Yes. No, I just want you to comment on Ambassador Zulaiman and Dr. Abdullahi's comments. Yeah, I've, uh, I, I heard uh, a good part of what Ambassador Lyman has said, and that's what I'm going to comment on. Um, uh, my first comment is, I would say that the parallels with the South African uh, experience stop at, uh, at the fact that there was a national dialogue. Uh, I, I don't think that there is any relevance to any uh, other uh, alleged similarities between the situation here and the situation in apartheid South Africa, uh, clearly. And, uh, uh, but I, I take uh, uh, his uh, remarks as uh, hopeful uh, remarks regarding the opportunity that this uh, initiative uh, would avail all Sudanese of. Uh, it is indeed, uh, as it has been declared, an inclusive Sudanese uh, process. And uh, the, the invitation is even out there for uh, even, even the armed groups, if they, are, if they show any willingness to give the national dialogue at least a first opportunity to other means that uh, they are uh, claiming to, uh, to achieve their, uh, their political goals, that would be enough uh, for their inclusion. I think it's a real opportunity, not just uh, a necessity uh, for uh, our situation here. Yeah, there are both uh, these factors that uh, the country really needs uh, a new minimum of uh, consensus, uh, that, uh, without which it would be very difficult to see how uh, we could continue to go, and particularly in our regional uh, uh, situation now when you look uh, to Sudan as uh, part of the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes and, and, uh, and the Middle East at the same time. With all that is going on, the Sudanese need to really avail themselves of this opportunity uh, to start this dialogue. I think, think there is a good opportunity here. The initial responses from uh, many uh, political uh, forces inside the country have been positive, uh, and, and also responses from outside, uh, let me call them observer nations or, or friends of, uh, of the Sudanese peace uh, process. Also, they, they have been positive. Thank you. I have a question for you to follow up uh, on that. Uh, what, what is a dialogue? When you say a dialogue, um, it was really hard for me to follow if it's something um, initiated by the government, of course, but you said that the armed conflict, armed, armed groups have to come and agree. Uh, uh, why they did not agree, and what is the definition of a dialogue? Because Ambassador Lyman highlighted a very important uh, 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 point that w defining the, the, the dialogue and the function of the dialogue is very important. Uh, what is it that people had agreed to and what is it that you're offering to the political parties to agree to? All right, the, the, the invitation itself uh, to this national dialogue has, uh, by way of just giving the contribution of the of, uh, NCP, has identified the uh, agenda uh, points or major areas, four, four of these areas, and these are we need to come to a minimum understanding and agreement uh, in regards to uh, one, peace, two, uh, democratization, three, the eradication or the alleviation of poverty, and four, uh, what we call the Sudanese identity. 
these four areas are areas where we have uh, been uh, this you know talking back and forth to each other since 1956 and uh, uh, we side claiming uh, some sort of a final word regarding uh, how to achieve peace and how to maintain it or regarding uh, the, the democratic system that we need to adopt and adhere to in Sudan. We feel like these are major areas where most of the points of, of difference between different uh, political schools of thought uh, are, are to be found and can be resolved. And uh, the objective is to arrive at a minimum uh, of consensus that would be enshrined in uh, the, the new constitution. And then the, the, the field is, uh, after that would be open, uh, hopefully and level, for every political school of thought to try and uh, develop the political process uh, to, towards their own ends. I mean, there are certain things that need to be agreed, and then the political difference after that uh, in a democratic fashion uh, should be uh, encouraged. This is, these are the, 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 the areas that we need to discuss. And the objective is to have all this feed into a constitutional uh, document. Great. Thank and you as very to much. your point regarding the, the, armed, the armed groups, I, don't, I didn't understand your point uh, clearly. But I said that they are included. Nobody is excluded from the invitation to come to the table and with with their uh, agenda, if the, the, the initiative said, if anybody uh, wants to add to, to this agenda item, they are uh, welcome. Great, we will go back to the armed group at some point when we discuss the security situation. Any one of our panelists would like to comment? Dr. Ahmed Hussein, please. Yes, I just want to um, thank the USP for uh, hosting this uh, timely and important actual meeting and discussion of our dialogue. And um, I just would like to say that the crisis of Sudan has uh, reached, uh, you know, a uh, very uh, turning point. You know, either it should be resolved through political and peaceful means or actually is going to be resolved by military means. So what we need is real transformation. Actually, I prefer actually, you know, the transformations to be through a peaceful means, which actually dialogue can play a tool actually for this kind of transformation. But actually, there is no way and there is no time, actually, given the situation right now on the ground that to play games or to buy time or something. So the dialogue has to be all-inclusive, serious, genuine, that can bring all the Sudanese stakeholders together to discuss the outstanding issues that actually led the country to the current situation, even, you know, the separation of the South Sudan or something like that. For a long time, actually, Sudanese people, they have been gathered together to discuss this, this kind of issue. What went wrong? Why the South Sudan actually separated? Because as we see, the same problems and the same policies that actually led and um, pushed the South Sudan to separate are existing till now. What we need actually for this kind of dialogue to be as serious and genuine and to bring the Sudanese people together to discuss, you know, the real issues, the fundamental issues, issues related to the state and religion, issues related to identity and all these kind of issues. Because the idea is to have a peaceful trans democratic transformation in the country. But, you know, the government of Sudan, and I actually refer to good point that made by Ambassador Lyman that when he said, you know, refer to the uh, example of South Africa. In South Africa, the apartheid regime at that time, actually, they had the political will. Actually, they took the initiative. They took the first step. And this is actually very important. What we need, actually, from the government of Sudan also, you know, to have a political will. And to understand that, as I said, you know, there is no any kind of playing tactics or games or to drag the country to another kind of election or something like that. This is very important. But they need to convince the people right now in Darfur, in South Kordofan, and Blue Nile, who are under enormous attacks, who are under actually Scorsese's campaign. They need to convince them that really this time they need business. They really mean business and they want this, uh, you know, to be ended peacefully. That, that is very important, and this actually goes back to the issue of who is going to participate in the dialogue or something like that. But these are the people who are right now suffering a great deal in the ITP camps and refugee camps. You need to convince these people, you need to convince them that the Sudanese state is also their state. And you know, their citizenship will also respect it. This, I think, is uh, it's very important. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, as I said, you know, either to be Sudan, either to be transformed peacefully 
and actually I prepared the peaceful transformation, democratic transformation of the country, or, you know, the, this war could continue. And as I said, you know, Sudan really at war is with itself. And this is going to be very uh, uh, painful. And actually, Sudanese people, they suffer too much, and they need actually to embark in a national dialogue to discuss the genuinely actually the outstanding issues, because we don't want more disintegration. And as I said, you know, if the current situation continues, there will be disintegration in the country, and there will be more actually fragmentation of the country. And as I said, you know, we are going to be like another Somalia or another, you know, one of these countries. But, but whether this is actually referred to the, honor, the issue of the ownership itself. I think one of the main things is ownership. We don't want actually the NCP or the ru ruling party or even the regime to say that we offer this and this. We, we don't have paid donors and recipients. All the Sudanese have to be donors. All the Sudanese actually to have to, to own the process from the beginning, from the procedural issues, from to us until the substantial issues. In this case, actually, we are going to have a genuine and serious actually process. Because as I said, you know, before also the government of Sudan said many things about national dialogue, but nothing actually materialized on the ground. So as I said, you know, they need to be a lot of things. They need to take a lot of measures and to give good signals and positive signals to Sudanese people that this time they, they really mean real business and they want this actually to be resolved peacefully. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed Hussein. This should also all be repeated again in the recommendation when we start to wrap up the first round because um, the definition of the dialogue has to be really, really clear who's the owner, who set gets to do what, and who gets to say what. Uh, because um, it, it could be a just um, an advisory function, and, 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 and this is something maybe we need to discuss also when the, with the challenges because the government might not give too much if, if, if it's not feeling safe. And people are not going to trust a lot if they're not giving what they want. So it's 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 going to be a very um, uh, a fine uh, line to walk on. Uh, Majdi, I want to uh, hear your voice, and, and and if you have any takes on what you have just heard. The debate, yeah. Now, yes. the, the 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 assumption you're making here is that the political conflict could be resolved by means of a negotiation between um, elite formations. And this, to me, seems a bit divorced from socioeconomic realities in the country. It is assumed that the national dialogue would bring in the major political parties around the negotiation table. However, as far as I can judge, this would exclude va vast swathes of the population who do not find political representation in these political organizations be they rebel movements or be they the mainstream political parties. Of course, this builds up on Abdullah's thesis that the political order that was born out of Sudan's independence has come to a point of exhaustion. And it is this, this is a very clear diagnosis and I would like to underline it. It is exactly this exhaustion that makes them less reasonable representatives of the voices of the people in question. As far as I can judge, the types of conflicts that are now emerging in Darfur, for instance, would be very hard to manage by means of an elite bargain. Consider, for instance, the exit of um, populations like the communities under the leadership of somebody like Musa Hilal or Mohammed Hamdan Himeti from southern Rizagat outside the political order proper. They don't even now consider the NCP as a representative. How would these populations, who are actually fighting in a sense, be included in a national process that is built on representation of political parties? And what sort of negotiation would that deliver to issues that, that contribute to forging conflict in Darfur? Essentially, land questions and so on. So my feeling that assuming that an elite bargain would deliver the type of transformation you saw in South Africa is a bit short-sighted and it does not consider the socio-economic realities in Sudan today. Great. Um, I think we're already tapping into the, the, the challenges uh, from the get-go. And uh, Would you like to comment yeah, on that? I may, I may add one point. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank you, uh, USIP, uh, for organizing this uh, very significant uh, event uh, on national dialogue in Sudan. Uh, there is no uh, doubt that national dialogue is uh, one of the most important uh, things that we, the Sudanese, uh, need to do uh, right now. 
uh, in order to deal uh, with our uh, uh, problems, intractable uh, problems, and uh, actually uh, find a way uh, for a better future uh, for ourselves and for the generations uh, to come. Uh, we all agree on that, and I think uh, what we need to uh, discuss actually uh, is not the necessity of this uh, dialogue, uh, not the meaning even of this dialogue, because uh, there is no particular or a specific uh, definition uh, for national dialogue. This can be actually one of the issues that can be uh, discussed at the beginning uh, of the process. But uh, we need to agree, uh, first of all, uh, as uh, Magdi Gizuli mentioned, that the current uh, political organizations do not represent uh, uh, genuinely the Sudanese uh, aspirations and the Sudanese people. That is one thing that we need to actually emphasize, and uh, I would be uh, very glad to hear uh, other perspectives from those who will uh, participate uh, on Skype. But I know uh, that uh, this, uh, or these organizations uh, are now uh, trying to negotiate with the government uh, to either maintain uh, their uh, privileges or restore uh, their privileges. The old uh, political club in Sudan uh, can reach any agreement with the government that uh, would uh, secure or uh, guarantee uh, uh, for it what it wants uh, from the government. Participation in power, uh, maintenance or restoration of, uh, of privileges. And that is very important. Which means that we uh, need also to discuss uh, not only uh, those who uh, would be participating in this uh, process, but also the principles upon which uh, the whole process uh, would be uh, established, actually. We have only uh, three scenarios as far as this uh, whole process is uh, concerned. First of all, uh, we could either uh, find maybe uh, a, a, right, a, a reasonable atmosphere uh, for national dialogue, which means that the government uh, would uh, take very uh, serious uh, decisions uh, to uh, make sure that everyone uh, takes uh, part in, in the process. That means uh, the current uh, laws that restrict freedoms should be uh, abolished. It also means that uh, people should be uh, given uh, free access to the media and among other uh, actually measures that should be uh, taken. These are not uh, conditions. These are requirements, necessary uh, steps that should be taken uh, in order to have a durable uh, uh, exercise of national uh, dialogue. And we could have, as I mentioned, and as uh, Dr. Abdullah uh, mentioned and Mehdi, uh, uh, an agreement between the government and the uh, organizations of the old political club. And this will uh, prolong uh, the life of the government indeed, but it will not uh, sort out the uh, chronic uh, problems of the country. And the final scenario is to uh, have this uh, uh, propaganda of national dialogue continue uh, without having any soli solutions and this uh, uh, will lead to the fragmentation of the country, if not in 10 years, in uh, 20 years, or maybe more uh, than that. Great. Thank you very much. John? You know, I might just add that um, it's important that we don't discuss the concept of national dialogue within a bubble uh, and recognize some of the other processes that are going on and discuss then how a national dialogue type of process is going to fit into those other processes. And so, what do I mean? For example, the Doha document uh, for Darfur, uh, how does any sort of national dialogue process feed into that for those who still think that the DDPD is something that we should hold on to? The ongoing negotiations in Addis Ababa led by the African Union High Level Panel, how does that fit into this process? Uh, Dr. Al Khatib mentioned the constitution making process. How does a national dialogue process square with the process of needing to write a new constitution, which is also a very uh, fundamental process which can also get at some of the underlying grievances and drivers of conflict in Sudan. And then finally, how does a national dialogue process relate to elections that are supposed to be scheduled for 2015? And I think this is a particularly important question. What I think we know from other successful national dialogue processes in other places is that they really take time two, three years, maybe more. Um, I've been a bit concerned by some of the discussion I've seen about national dialogue in, in Sudan saying it will happen in October. 
it doesn't happen in a month. It probably doesn't happen in a year. Uh, and so I think uh, accepting that reality early on is very important. But if we accept that, then, then any process is going to run into 2015 when elections are scheduled. If there are elections uh, in the midst of a genuine national dialogue process, I think there is a risk that that throws the dialogue process off track, which would be uh, a shame if it really does have some momentum. Yeah, you're really right because um, 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 first the time is not only needed for, for the dialogue but also for building the trust and, and for people to invest in it. Uh, it, it feels very, um, uh, very like, um, short planned especially with the with the timing of the of the uh, election and the writing of the constitution and a lot of people are specula speculating that the government is is making this whole national dialogue in a way just to make the constitution and to 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 resolve that question of the constitution and still run for election which is not going to be fair even for the old school parties because they're not on equal footing when when it comes to to resources and, 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 and um, ability and capacity to run for elections. Um, feel free to, to, since we're already discussing the challenges and all that, and um, if you, what about Mr. Khatib, if you could respond to the thing about the time and how um, the time is not enough to, to, to start the, or to not even to, to come to, to, to conclusion with, the, with the, uh, the dialogue. As you just said that a lot of people have not been, uh, did not respond yet. And there's also the question that Majid Jazuli raised about um, those who are out of the traditional political parties, uh, the non-state actors as rebel, rebels or people like who don't have a political representation. How do you think the current initiative addresses those uh, sector of the society or, uh, or groups in the society? Well, uh, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, I think he raised, uh, Mehdi Juzuli raised uh, a very uh, good point. And uh, the, the initiative itself, we, uh, it has uh, also addressed that. We, uh, it is said that this is not only a dialogue uh, between the political parties amongst themselves, whether these, these political parties are traditional or new uh, or, or what have you. It needs to include all other uh, co communities in Sudan. And, uh, and so that, uh, that, that point is, uh, is very much on the minds of everybody as they, uh, or before they uh, embark on this, uh, on this national dialogue. And uh, uh, his or anybody else's uh, suggestion as to how to include, because uh, we, are, we are going to be faced by claims of, uh, of uh, representativeness of this or that segment of our society. Uh, and, uh, and that was uh, really the reason why uh, it had to have been declared as an all-inclusive uh, uh, dialogue for everybody so as not to even give an opportunity to any claim of denial of opportunity or banning from participation uh, to, to even uh, be raised by anybody. Uh, having said that, so I agree with him that uh, we need to have everybody present there, all, uh, all classes, all uh, different localities, all different interests. Great. And, Mr. Khatib, uh, I'm sorry need, to, to cut need you to off. to see there. But the elite uh, that he has uh, correctly, I again agree with him, uh, criticized for not uh, uh, being 100% uh, able Mr. Al -Khatib, do you hear uh, me? To, uh, to resolve these issues, he, he himself and, and me and probably all of your guests, uh, as Sudanese, are part of that uh, elite. Uh, so... Uh, they have to be there, uh, but other, uh, other segments of Sudanese society need to be there. And that was uh, why it, it was, this invitation was sent to everybody, including, as I said earlier, to the, the uh, armed groups, if they say. I mean, we are not looking here for uh, uh, something as radical as saying we, because there is an initiative for national dialogue, hereby renounce uh, 
uh, you know, resorting to violence for good. But at least they should say, we will give this dialogue a first, uh, the, the, the first yeah. opportunity. We will get we'll to this part about how feasible that to have everybody. I will just give the last um, for Mr. Ambassador since he has to leave. Uh, I apologize for that and uh, to Saeed and others. Uh, look, you know, whenever with this kind of thing is raised and any, any country has to face this, the first question, the first reaction you get is, it's hard. Yeah, it's going to be very hard. But I think to just say you're going to include everybody is also a trap, because if you invite everybody, there's no structure. So one of the first things that has to be done is to think through how you structure it. And that means perhaps a series of different dialogues or, 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 or sub-dialogues that move to how you get this representation how do you decide who represents all classes, et cetera? So there's a process here of, of just defining the whole, that which, which needs to be done. And it seems to me that one of the first steps is to put this process under a structure other than the government itself. That is to create a vehicle that can begin to think through this, whether it's a judge or it's a, a, a structure that's respected that begins to consult with people as to how you bring people in. And you have a series of, of dialogues until you have defined clearly for everyone how this will move from a general discussion to something more definitive. It's going to be difficult, and I agree with John. This is going to take some time. But the fundamental early decision on the part of the government and the others is this is going to lead to a fundamental transformation of the way Sudan is governed. If that isn't the starting point, even though, though one hasn't defined exactly where that comes out, if that isn't the starting point, then people will get quickly discouraged and it won't go far. I apologize for having to to step out, but I hope this dialogue continues, and I think a lot of Thanks good ideas you, have come. Do you want me to unblock you? Sorry, Mr. Al Khati, for uh, interrupting you earlier. Say but something about uh, what uh, Prince Lyman just said. Uh, we will um, actually, why, since the structure of the dialogue has been coming up yeah. in the conversation um, uh, from most of well, the... Well, it's, it's about that as well. Uh, everybody has been talking when, when this initiative was made and, and the, the initial responses. Uh, and maybe rightly so, everybody was asking, what is the mechanism? Who is going to be actually uh, seeing to it that this that the national dialogue actually uh, starts and, uh, and, and develops? And uh, the initiative, uh, when it was declared, it said that we, as Sudanese, all of us need to, to talk about this mechanism. The mechanism is uh, very clearly, it is not the government. Uh, the mechanism itself needs to be agreed to by all, all uh, you know, who, who are going to be participating in this dialogue. When I say all, of course, I don't mean that you are going to, uh, to uh, consult every Sudanese about this mechanism. But uh, the, those who have already respond, responded positively are talking about the mechanism. And I think it's going to be uh, declared, hopefully, uh, very soon. Basically, uh, it is uh, going to be uh, some, some sort of mechanism that, that is made up of Sudanese who have no affiliation to any of uh, the, the political forces that are on the scene right now. Great. And, um, I will have to, like, I will. Uh, also a presence, Mr. Uh, Khatib, Mr. Khatib, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but uh, because we want to keep the mechanism at, at, at a different um, at session so we can easily respond to that. But since we're still off the structure part, I would like to take uh, Dr. Abdullahi. But hold that thought uh, because we're going to go back to it when we start talking about the recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, in, in terms of structure and how are we going to structure this, we are talking about the uh, 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 entities that are present and active and in practice. Uh, 
Prolo Nasreddin and uh, Majidi, uh, we are talking and I, we are talking about uh, forces that are absent, not really uh, in, 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 uh, in practice. And I mean by that what came to be known later as the civil society. And I'm not talking about civil society in general terms, I'm talking about uh, the specific forces of labor, students, tenants, uh, and the like. And these cannot be represented in this, in this dialogue without a, 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 a democratic environment, without liquidating certain laws that prevent uh, 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 free elections to trade unions, free elections to students, uh, and tenants formations. This needs to be emphasized because this force w was or has been the major force in all political changes. Uh, the parties were, has not, have not been a major force in the major transformations in Sudan, and I'm uh, specifically talking about October Revolution and, 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 and uh, 1985 Revolution. The rebels uh, were assisting factors in this transformation. They never toppled any government up to this moment, although they are the most vocal and the most vigorous today. So the, if, you are, if you are talking about a conflict that is culturally and politically and historically ingrained, you, are, you need not to miss on these forces. And this is, and this puts it on Al Khatib's uh, quarter. What are you going to do with these forces in structuring the dialogue? What, how are you going to stay with what we call the uh, labor movements, uh, laws, trade union laws with Al Muncha? That is, everybody in, for example, the railway, uh, from the from the top leaders to the uh, to the lowest paid. Those are all in a trade union, which makes it a, a, a farce. Uh, uh, what about the students? Now their students are withdrawing completely from the polit from politics. They, these used to be the guys who make, uh, who, who really do the change by changing the balance of power. We are talking about dialogue without changing the balance of power. That, that can happen. Uh, the, 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 the government will always have the upper hand. Today, after the president's talk about dialogue, a guy was killed. Trid uh, every day we have a, a newspaper ban, two, three, four at, at a time. Uh, and the president would go to the police forces and tell them, take all the money you want, <laughs> which, which we call the money that is cited on the, on the line for, for, for the uh, special uses for these horses. So you cannot, you know, unless you change the balance of power, you are talking about dialogue, you are talking about it being genuine, but you are really working under the uh, shadow of Big Brother. Great. Uh, I think we should start making the tally of the, all the challenges we have. First, we have the problem with the structure, that it's, it's a bit not clear. And, and, and it only focuses on political parties and those known uh, power. We have the problem with the time frame that A, we have a constitution that's going to be invalid, uh, B, we have an election that's too soon, um, which like it's very hard to have a viable dialogue done before then. And then we have the uh, balance of power of who's who, and I think the balance of power is it's pretty much linked to the problem or the process of building trust. And, and maybe this is uh, the best, uh, the first step to address is how to build the trust um, uh, on the part of the government and on the part of the participants, um, whoever they might be. And, and, and maybe also uh, on a sub challenge, we have the representation of others, especially that most of the um, uh, trade unions and, and others are pretty much affiliated with the NCP. Uh, the, this, the, the school, the 
it's pretty much politicized and, and, and takes a sharp uh, affiliation with NCP as well. So this balance of power and part like this is one of the challenges. Is, is there anything else that we've missed? I guess um, I would like um, uh, to comment on one idea that came up about the uh, malicious and uh, this malicious uh, this illusion with the government of something. Well, I think the malicious has been have been created by the government of Sudan, and actually they are acting on behalf of the government of Sudan. If you talk about Hemeti militia, actually they are under the uh, sponsorship and organization and control of command by the uh, SNIS or Sec Sudanese Security Force or something. So there is no way that to say you know they are actually acting independently. So this is very important, actually. Uh, I have to say that. The other thing also before you know going to all this kind of detail. You know, the conducive environment for this dialogue. As I said, you know, there, there have been many occasions that President Bashir and the government of Sudan uh, say something about dialogue. You know, they launched initiative about dialogue. You know, I'm talking about, you know, Djibouti in 1999 or something like that. And then another thing, actually, or Sudan conference in 2008. And then also another thing, you know, after, time after time, actually, they're saying, but the question is, are they really serious this time and genuine? You know, I'm saying this because what is happening on the ground right now, you know, and this is one of the challenges, you know, because there is a war. And don't not forget that, you know, this stage, which actually, you know, led the government of Sudan to talk about dialogue, is because there are ongoing conflict, because Sudan is at war with itself. There is a conflict now, you know, side in Darfur, in South Kordofan, and Blue Nile. What we are going to do about this kind of thing? This is the government of Sudan. Since al-Bashir launched his uh, speech, in January two, uh, 27, did he did anything that to convince these people and to send them positive signal that actually this time he's different, this time he really you know understand and recognize their citizenship? I don't think that the situation on the ground can prove this kind of thing because as we see as we see right now there is a scorch as campaign in Darfur, South Kordofan, and Bulunay. Khora Bashir actually attacked yesterday the areas you know just by Niala also attacked and in Al-Fashir, ITP comes and all this kind of thing. So what we need is, you know, to give this kind of signals. You know, they have to refrain from attacking civilian population. They have to refrain from harassing the ITP. They have to refrain from, you know, attacking and killing, you know, innocent, you know, students who are demonstrating or something like that. All we need, you know, signals, positive signals that people, these people are really need. Because without conducive environment, there will be no trust can be built. You talk about the trust, and this is one of the challenges. Because there is a huge gap of trust that need to be filled. And I think the onus is on the government of Sudan. They have to take measures. That's why, you know, a lot of people, they were very disappointed of Al Bashir, President Bashir, you know, his speech in January 2000, because people expected measures, tangible measures, tangible, you know, kind of, you know, uh, procedures, you know, and, and, and points, you know, to convince the people. But people were disappointed because nothing actually came out of that speech until now. What they see is more attacks and more killing and more arrests and more, more burning us, like Dr. Uh, Ibrahim said, you know, to, you know, newspapers and all this kind of thing. We really need a creative enabling conditions, if I may say, enabling atmosphere, atmosphere so that, you know, can lead the country for all this kind of thing. About the representation, I think um, all we say, this, this has to be very inclusive. That actually is the time. But we need first to stop the war, to stop the conflict. This is one of the main things, and I think I refer to John, um, you know, a point about the ongoing processes. There is a process actually in uh, uh, Addis Ababa about SPLM knows about the two areas. Yeah, I want to talk about the ad hoc, uh, this mechanism of, like, you mentioned that. You said how you want to have all these ad hoc peace talks or negotiation to fall into that. Is that possible? No, I don't think that you're going to get, you know, some nice, neat package where you can make it all fit together and it's all going to work out perfectly. And, you know, I think we have to emphasize here, we, we can't wait for perfection on these things in order to move forward. Now, that's not to say that the current situation is, is amenable to some of what we're talking about here because uh, I think it probably isn't right now. Uh, but this is going to be messy and, and there are going to be some processes that, that probably sort of dissipate and, and disappear. Um, but I still think that we need to be a lot more clear as to what we really mean when we say national dialogue. And there's, it starts to be a risk of becoming this sort of all-encompassing buzzword that means different things to different people. And 
you know, if you're trying to reach some sort of consensus on governance of the country and these very fundamental issues, that starts by some sort of consensus on what the process even means. And it still feels like we're a little bit ways off from that. Yes, that's true. Um, um, because I, I want to throw this question again, because obviously what we mean by a dialogue is completely different than what the government means. According to Sayyid al-Khatib, that they have invited everybody to talk. And um, what the, maybe that's the process, and that's as far as it goes to the government at this point. Maybe the government itself needs some assurance from, the, from their, its own partners at this point. Well, at the other side, there are people who think that dialogue is actually sharing power. Uh, that's also my understanding. And to that end, nothing has been delivered. Actually, the environment is not conducive as, as, uh, at all to deliver such thing. Um, do you have anything, uh, Mr. Dean? Well, I, uh, I would add that uh, we need actually to uh, have specific uh, measures in place in order to start uh, that uh, dialogue, national dialogue. Uh, regarding the, uh, the meaning, I think uh, we should uh, agree or, co or consider agreeing on uh, defining uh, national dialogue as a process. There are defini different definitions uh, uh, academic definitions for uh, national dialogue. Uh, some people might think about it as uh, as a method. Uh, some people might think about it as a purpose in itself, uh, with no any commitment to reaching uh, agreements on specific issues. But I think in our particular situation, uh, national dialogue uh, should be a process uh, through which we can uh, actually uh, discuss the issues that we are. Uh, uh, actually uh, raised by Dr. Khatib, in particular identity, uh, issue, uh, the identity issues, the issue of uh, transforming the country to uh, democracy. Uh, uh, for, uh, th this is very, very important. Uh, with regard to what we need to do uh, before we embark on uh, national dialogue, I think the government uh, needs uh, actually to uh, abolish all the laws that restrict uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. That is one. Two, it also needs uh, to uh, limit the power of the national intelligence and security services, which has become an empire action in Sudan. Uh, it can do whatever it wants, uh, assassination of students, uh, actually uh, stopping writers from uh, actually contributing to their newspapers, and, uh, and so on. Uh, three, we need actually to have uh, a cessation of hostilities between the uh, warring uh, parties in Sudan uh, right now. Uh, we, we might not be able to reach, uh, as we know, uh, an agreement, a peace agreement with different uh, movements that are fighting uh, the government uh, for uh, very legitimate uh, reasons. But we need to have uh, a cessation of hostilities. Uh, uh, from the part of the political organizations, I think, and I, when I say political organizations, again, I don't mean as the only the uh, political organizations of the old political club. I also mean the new uh, forces, youth, uh, the student uh, organizations that are, uh, that are actually representing a new generation of uh, Sudanese activists and politicians who have their own uh, view and uh, perspectives uh, on how the country uh, actually should be ruled in the future. The, the main question is the question of governance. So uh, these uh, political organizations uh, need to take uh, the invitation uh, seriously. Not forever, but at least for some time we will uh, maybe determine one year or six months that uh, we will take this initiative seriously and we will wait uh, for the government uh, to take uh, some practical uh, steps uh, towards uh, preparing the atmosphere for uh, actually meaningful debate over the different issues that are uh, actually that need to be addressed. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Al Khatib, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I would like to refer to you about two things. One, the time of question, especially with all these issues that are at hand, like uh, conflicts on Blue Nile, uh, Kurdistan, uh, Darfur. You have an economic issue also deteriorating in Sudan. You have um, a lot of challenges facing the government. Maybe the, the, they might be the reason for the government to rush this process of the, of the national dialogue, but don't you think that doing that before 2015 
it's too early for the process to bear fruit. And the second question, I think it's actually, it's more important than the first one, is to what extent the government is actually considering crossing, uh, like reaching out, reaching across the aisle to people to build that trust. Not only saying that we send an invitation, you come according to our terms while everything status quo does not change. Like uh, we, especially all these news about students being killed and, and, and the aggression starting again over and over again in Darfur and like the freedom of expression and all that. To what extent is the government actually considering um, 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 making the environment uh, conducive for trust building and, and, and more invitational than just inviting people to come? All right. Um, you see that the quality of sound at my end here is really not uh, that good. But I think your first question regards the, the time available, the timing or the time available for the discussion in this dialogue. And, and the second one, uh, as I understood it, is, you know, uh, some sort of a conducive environment uh, based on the premises that the, con the environment right now is not really conducive for a free uh, dialogue. Have I have I yes. uh, addressed your questions yes, correctly? Yes, pretty much. Yes, you're correct. One is about oh. the time, uh, 2015, and the other one is about the conducive environment and right. Um, uh, right. human rights uh, situation in Sudan. Right. I think uh, you know the 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 gravity of. Uh, I mean, uh, what we are we are getting ourselves into as a country. Um, makes time really uh, a very important issue. So while I understand uh, the point of people who say, are we going to be uh, able to discuss all of these very serious issues in, uh, very thoroughly in, in the time that uh, is available to us now before, before the elections? Uh, or, and between those who think that th there's no time to uh, really waste anymore. We have seen the process uh, of uh, Somalia when they were uh, perpetually meeting to discuss the, the, such issues uh, in Kenya for years and years. Uh, this, this needs, uh, we, we need to really calibrate that so that we do not uh, do injustice to very important issues by not giving uh, enough time and at the same time knowing the nature of uh, you know our people and and uh, and, and our really uh, great love for uh, you know analyzing things to death and beyond, uh, we need also to be careful not to have this as an open-ended sort of uh, that will defeat the purpose of this na national dialogue. It is based on the fact that we have very serious challenges and at the same time we have opportunities and that these opportunities are not going to to stay there waiting for us until we uh, you know finish splitting all hairs and doing all kinds of uh, in-depth analyses okay, for I have a question for you issue. of that um, when you say that there's no time for this I do understand that especially given all the challenges that government is facing but uh, at this point, are you like because the con like the elections? There's also a constitution that's going to be invalid, and uh, don't you think for the process of making a um, very uh, a more uh, genuine constitution reforms and rewriting that, don't you think that the political environment should be uh, not like now, and 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 for that political environment to improve, to to produce a constitution that it's gonna be a permanent constitution, don't you think yeah. that the political parties and political uh, players should have enough uh, time to prepare themselves? Uh, they should have worked through all the weeds of the, of the, of the conflict that's been there for 25 years. The, government, the country has been at war since the beginning, so you cannot over finish that in less than a year and a half. Um, I, I beg to differ, I think uh, if people come to uh, convene with seriousness around uh, uh, the table and talk about these issues, I think one and, one and a half years is is uh, is quite adequate time for people to resolve 
the major uh, issues that need to be actually fed into a constitutional drafting process. Because you, 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 you cannot go into uh, this thinking that we are going to uh, resolve every single problem that uh, Sudan is faced with. True. Uh, this, what about uh, that, Mr. Khatib? I, I have a follow I know like there's so much to say about the topic, but of your point that you just made, don't you think that one of the major issues that will take us again to making the environment conducive, don't you think the most important thing now that actually the government activates the, the, the laws in the Constitution currently about the human rights and, 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 and freedom of expression, and don't you think that could build the, the, the trust needed for this process to happen? It could happen actually in a year if 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 the environment is more conducive, if if there's more yes. more trust yeah. brought to the table. About about the environment being conducive, like I indicated earlier when I was talking about uh, Mr. Juzuli's uh, remarks, I think everything that needs to be done or can be done to make the the environment more conducive to a free dialogue should be uh, done by the government. And I think there is there is uh, latitude for that. I think. Many things uh, are being contemplated, uh, but uh, I, I need to make a point here. People need to need to differentiate between uh, demands or or uh, or ideas that are supposed to be more of the nature of what needs to come as an outcome of this dialogue, and and between uh, CBMs. These are different things. And uh, so because you are, you, you, you are going to open uh, the, the debate and, and close it before the dialogue itself starts, people are going to say from this side, uh, the, the, you know, uh, human rights uh, uh, are not yet uh, to, to uh, the level that would make this dialogue, uh, you know, flourish. You will find people from the other side, not only the government, but those who want to enter into this dialogue and have others not come to this dialogue will say, no, the human rights uh, situation is fine. You don't want that to start before the dialogue itself starts. You don't want that to be uh, s some sort of a bone of contention before also Sudanese come to discuss it seriously and intelligently. So, uh, so CBMs like, for example, declaring uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, acquiescing, I might say, and mind you, I'm not talking, I'm not speaking for the government here. I'm speaking as an observer who sees what is going on and who can claim that th th this uh, thing the government would do or not do. I think some of these things are going to be met to an extent that is going to be considered by the government as reasonable and by some of the, of those who have welcome the government's invitation as reasonable. Great. So I think thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but it's just the, the time. I just want and the... to tell you that uh, I, will, I will be uh, also uh, discontinuing. I'm, I'm finding difficulties and I have to run anyway. And I, 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 before going away, I want to thank you very much thank you uh, for, for joining us. availing me of this opportunity. And uh, I also would like to salute the other uh, participants in this uh, in this dialogue. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Sorry for the difficulties. Thank you. Majdi? Shame that Said uh, decided to leave, but um, there's a point of criticism to be made about how the discussion has been going. I think the first is how abstract it has all become. I mean, um, the, um, and the abstraction, I, I think, comes from the assumption that you're talking about a negotiation process between um, the political forces of the mainstream. And that's why issues like political freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of association come second. Because for a, to, for a meeting between Turabi and President Bashir to happen, or between Turabi and Sadiq, or Sadiq and Bashir to happen, you don't really need a lot of political freedom. You just need to jump in from one house to another. But for a genuine political process that, in, that has a popular nature, that involves people and wide organizations, you need freedom of expression. This is not an outcome of the process. This is the initial precondition of it. And um, if these freedoms are not there, are not available, and people can't clutch them, then there is no, there is no national dialogue to talk about. 
Now, Abdullah earlier on said something about the balance of power, which brings us back from this abstraction of a, of a liberal-minded process that is designed top-down by a decree of government or by a speech of a president into uh, a matter that brings in people into the political arena. And this is exactly what we need. And I don't think this is something that um, is going to happen by deliverance from a government. This is something that's going to happen by organization um, where, where people have political demands. The fact that the government cannot see these things now or is not willing to see them abolishes the idea of a national dialogue in itself and leaves us at the space of conflict. Of course, uh, conflict is not always armed, but um, the, 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 the forms of conflict that we are now seeing are heading more and more towards uh, an armed uh, nature. And pol political conflict is becoming much more difficult than it was because people don't have avenues to show their politics or demonstrate their politics because they're reduced to the basic minimum of political existence. Now, th um, the idea that the government can continue talking about national dialogue without translating this into a popular process makes it all a bit ridiculous, I must say. You're right. Um, we need to, I think, more focus about how to make this conducive. And I think, again, we're going back to the point of, of, of John and, and the others about the definition of a, a national dialogue. Uh, I think we are seeing it from different uh, perspectives. And, and I think for the government... Well, uh, one assumption is that the national dialogue is something like an extended CPA negotiation process. But we've seen what, where that ends. Um, anything that doesn't have a popular element to it and that is not associated with um, uh, uh, some sort of political emancipation, allowing people freedom of association, freedom of organization to show what, what these issues are. Because the issues that I can see now are totally limited to power sharing, really. It's all about bargaining, shares, and cuts in ministries. But these are not the socioeconomic realities of the country. These are not the daily concerns of people who would be um, candidates for inclusion in this political process. And I think we should hear from, from the others what this differentiation is between an elite bargain and a popular process. And, and I think that's the heart of the matter. Are we heading towards an elite bargain, uh, something like the CPA in an extended fashion, including the mainstream political parties? Or are we heading to a, to a popular process that brings in communities and people and organizations who have been out of the terrain? And this is, in essence, also a class issue. Great. Thank you so much. That's an interesting point, Dr. Abdullah. Yeah, uh, regarding the uh, how to how to introduce uh, the uh, a new uh, 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 some new blood into this, we need to distinguish between a, na a national dialogue and the kind of conflict resolutions negotiations that uh, have been the order of the day for a long time. And I'd like just now to, to look at Addis Ababa at this time, you know. We have people coming from Sudan to, to negotiate a, a settlement, and people from southern Sudan coming to negotiate a settlement. Look also at uh, the government of Sudan is now uh, trying or en ended trying people like Yasser Arman and all those. Look at the situation in southern Sudan in which uh, people like Baghdad Mom and all these people are uh, being tried before court. So is, how long, uh, for how long are we going to go this pass? We need to despair at, at, at one point of time and look at other things. So that, we, we, we seem to have uh, uh, come to uh, the, 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 the end of this road. And although we, as John said, we need to keep the fruits of this road, Dauha and all those things, and many Sudanese are frustrated because uh, some American diplomats, diplomats were talking about the Dauha uh, has expired or ended or something like that. But we need to keep all these things, and we turn to a kind of a national dialogue in the uh, in the term that we are trying to define. Uh, and most importantly, because the kind of dialogue, the kind of negotiations taking place now in Addis Ababa and in other places uh, w have been designed, conceived as, uh, as what you call it, putting out fires. 
for a long time the guy who seems to attract the attention of the government and the international community is a rebel with a gun. And this is the reason why the civil society uh, kind of fell through the cracks. And uh, in, in the rare moment they remember this civil society, they are talking about capacities and things like that and picking here and picking there. So we need to understand why we have this kind of stalemate. Things like em emblematic now in Addis Ababa. These are enduring conflicts. And enduring conflicts is about society, about politics, about culture ingrained in this. And, peop and the international community was all the have been all the time trying to, to, to put out fires. Uh, without really looking at the civil society. Although, as I said, the civil society in Sudan is robust, is rig vigorous, and it has, a, 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 it has been tried as a, change, a force of change. And people are now trying to say, okay, why don't you have a, an Arab Spring? Like, we, we, like this is a must. <laughs> Like no, we will <laughs> have it in our own terms. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Go ahead. First of all, I, I very much agree with the point that the international community has a tendency to to focus a lot on the firefighting and the crisis of the day without simultaneously being able to focus on the longer term change. But I, I want to go back to to Majdi's point about how to make this a a popular process and not an elite process because I think that really is at the crux of the issue, and I. I think there's a lot of open questions about if and how that's possible. I think that raises a real question about the role of the international community in any sort of national dialogue process. And when I say international community, I'm not really talking about the West or the US. I'm talking more about Africa and the sort of closer international community. But is there a way for Africa to, to help to carve out the space needed for national dialogue. If you look back at some of the consultations that happened in Darfur prior to the AU report on Darfur, President Tembeki's report, uh, they did pretty extensive consultations around Darfur. There were some flaws, uh, and some others can probably pick up on that, but they were also consultations unlike any others that have happened, at least in the recent peacemaking process, uh, in terms of, from my understanding, participation and some frank dialogue happening. So is that somewhat of a model that can be used throughout the country in order to have the kind of grassroots popular consultations that need to feed into some sort of a larger process? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think we need to start looking at those uh, concrete ideas as to how to create the space that we all, I think, agree is needed in order for a genuine process to unfold. Great, thank you, John. I have a question that also falls between what John just said and, and Amjad and Majdi. It's like, to what extent people actually going to feel safe to say what they want? And again, that takes us to the conducive environment. To what extent people who are not affiliated with any one of the political parties, who are not part of any civil society, just like individuals, and, and to what extent they are safe to say what they want, uh, what is the mechanism of to gag how they want it to be? And there's so many questions also about the transition, uh, transitional justice uh, and, and how it's going to be part of the national dialogue. This is also comes up a lot in the conversation. Would you? I, I just want to say that you know, um, uh, the nature of the regime is different from the, the nature of the regimes in uh, you know, during the Mary time or during Abu time in 1964 or something like that. Because now we have, you know, hundreds of militias. So it's the entire country is very, very armed. So it's, it's very difficult, you know, you know, to say that, you know, this is just uh, without political work from the government is going to be ended just peacefully or something like that. So let's remind ourselves of that one. And also the current struggle, armed um, struggle actually, whether in Darfur or South Kordofan and Brunei, has, you know, a legitimate kind of ground. Uh, because, you know, this is because of the failure of the post-colonial state and the failure of the elite 
you know, you can say them, the fathers of the independence or those who actually associated with them or something, they felt actually to don't step that to be inclusive, with inclusive citizenship. That's why all this kind of problems also, you know, are, are happening right now and there is a military struggle or something. Also, one of the challenges and, you know, the dangers, this is not going to be elite or something. Also, there is a danger that this also to be like northern and northern, I mean, northern riverian kind of action or process or something without actually including or without putting on board from the beginning people actually from Darfur, from South Kurdufan and Blue Nile. This is one of the main dangers. And let me also say there will be no legitimacy or support for any kind of dialogue without actually people on the ground there feel it. Feel it, you know, safety, feel it, you know, in terms of security and all this kind of thing. As I said, you know, there is bleeding actually. People are bleeding right now actually on the ground. And, um, and, and, and I think we have actually to consider this, you know, in a proper way. Freedom of expression, I think one of the demands, very, very important, but also actually the safety of the people on the ground, I think also one of the, of the, of the yeah, important it's, thing. Yeah, it's pretty much, um, it actually it says it all. If, if about the role about the international community. And I think the role of this international community, I think, is very important. Because as I said, we just mentioned that. But what do you think about the point that John raised that uh, a regional force uh, actually has been more closer to the situation and had more consultation and could help more with the popular part of the Because we already actually tested the regional organization. I remember very well in 2004 we met with Said Janet. He was the director of Peace and Security Council of the African Union. At that time he said Darfur was a test case for the African Union. And they said that they would succeed actually in, in this test case. But actually the role of the African Union is a complete failure. In terms of Even in security, in points? terms of security, in, peace or in terms of political, uh, you know, process and all this kind of thing. From what I see is right now, you know, I'm very proud to be African. I actually support the African Union, but with the current leadership of the African Union and current capacity, I think they cannot actually be able to facilitate this kind of national dialogue. What we need is actually, you know, um, multi, you know, I mean, organization, you know, from different kind of international community. The um, uh, you know, the United States and others, especially also Security Council and some European countries, African countries, they have to come form some sort of forum, maybe you can call it Friends of Sudan or something like that, you know, to facilitate, you know, bringing the people together. Because the, the current mistrust is going to be very difficult, you know, for the Sudanese actually to come together, actually. And, and I know that this is Sudanese process and has to be Sudanese process, but we need facilitators. But the African Union cannot facilitate this uh, in any way. But the, my, last qu my last answer also is, um, you know, this shouldn't be dictated by the NCP. This should be, yeah, owned, should be more owned by the Sudanese stakeholders. We will come back to the structure part, and, 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 and that's very interesting, John, when you want to respond after we go to Majdi. Majdi, you have something to say? I, I'd like to comment on the African Union process in that forum. I think, as John rightly said, it was one of the most successful processes that the AU in Sudan ever organized. The problem was it never came to fruition. What the final outcome of it, apart from the report, was very little. But the, the, the way in which it was done, the scope, the length, the, um, the participation was magnanimous. One must say that. And I think it, it is, uh, it might not be exactly the model to follow, but it's definitely the type of engagement you need. On the other hand, you would probably um, require uh, levels of organization from the communities involved to bring in themselves and their forms, their own forms of organization, their own agency, and not this dictate by um, uh, a government or by the United Nations Security Council as much as I care, or even by the African Union. You, uh, this, th there, is, th there is a level of agency that has to be kept to the people involved and not immediately delivered to a, a, a mediator or a supervisor or a facilitator. And this type of agency was to a degree visible in the AU process uh, when Tabubiki was playing it out uh, before he turned into other issues. When his focus was Darfur, it was pretty interesting. And the types of issues that came out brought us away from this prison of thinking around uh, power sharing all the time and uh, who has guns and who doesn't. It allowed people who don't have guns to make their voice heard because it's not um, uh, restricted to the uh, to, to the warring parties. The idea that political problems and uh, social problems, economic problems in Sudan are limited to the warring parties is a false one. And it only creates more warring parties. It invites more people into the battlefield. 
but it does not reduce the capacity for violence when you only focus on these players. The one big advantage of the AU process in, uh, in Darfur was exactly this. It allowed other people who do not have arms to play uh, in the field, to be involved, to have a voice and to organize. But it's not only about having a voice, it's also about organizing political forms, novel political forms that would contribute to, to a wider process. And in that regard, Sudan is not a blank slate. I mean, there is a long tradition of indigenous political organization in the country. It has taken multiple and varied forms uh, through its history, going as far back as the Mahdiya and as recent as 1985. People are pretty ingenious in devising their forms of political organization. And this agency has to be restored to the citizens of the country. Great, thank you very much. I have a question um, uh, for you, Nasruddin, um, about the transitional justice and, and how do you see that as a part of the national dialogue and whether should it come first or it be addressed at a later point? Well, uh, I think uh, justice in general uh, should be one of the principles uh, on which we should agree uh, as one you know, uh, thing that we uh, need to make sure that is not compromised uh, uh, during or after uh, the process of national dialogue. Uh, this means uh, that we uh, should make sure that every uh, body who uh, committed or commits uh, human rights uh, violations or uh, fundamental freedoms should be uh, held responsible uh, through domestic or international uh, justice uh, mechanisms. Uh, we know that we, uh, we have a lot of uh, issues right now. We had a lot of issues in the past uh, that uh, have to do with, uh, with justice. And justice should uh, certainly be one of the, of the principles uh, of uh, national uh, or dialogue. What about the big elephant in the room, the G ICC, and, and uh, how, how, how are we going to deal with that? Is well, I think uh, we, we should uh, also make sure that we don't compromise uh, this issue. Uh, uh, justice uh, is very necessary for any durable uh, peace in Sudan. It is uh, necessary for stability. And uh, that is uh, one issue that we should actually uh, emphasize uh, uh, while we are talking about this uh, national uh, dialogue process. Uh, justice, as we know, can be done uh, domestically and it can also be done uh, internationally uh, depending on the situation uh, of those who can actually be uh, tried uh, domestically. But you, we know that there are people who cannot be uh, tried uh, uh, locally or domestically because uh, they are uh, powerful. And the whole uh, this the uh, ICC uh, uh, system was actually uh, invented uh, to deal with this kind of issues. Uh, we should not compromise uh, that. Great. Uh, Dr. You can see that uh, I think we are trying really to, there is some revision of that, at least probably not in Sudan, but if you read Lyman's uh, proposal, and if you read Abeke and uh, Mamdanis, uh, and I think uh, a, a, a reading of trying really to balance between justice and, and democracy and peace. Uh, I think when we refer to the Af South African experiment, it's, 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 it doesn't, it, doesn't it, 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 it seems to, to, to uh, support mostly the question of uh, uh, peace over uh, or stability, democracy over uh, over justice, because they, they you know even the national African National Party was condemned uh, because of its atrocities, which are very limited and very narrow. And 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 when the national uh, African National Party uh, protested. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, Bishop Tutu what was, was told them no. President uh, who? Mandela said them no, we need to accept that. So there is, there is this question of the elephant in the room. What are we going to do with it? We, we can keep talking about you know, uh, people being accountable and things like that, but what ultimately we, we are left with in Sudan with the ICC is a wounded beast in Sudan. And, and this is a, a, a personal problem and a, and a, a, a system problem. The guy is, is having his, his back to the wall. 
elections won't serve any purpose because he would like to be there. So I'm not saying, you know, give him a safe way, but ac would we accept a negotiations taken into, taken properly as we are trying to design it now, are we going to accept a, the Lyman's proposal Baker's proposal, this needs to be addressed, particularly in places like Darfur and in uh, between, the, between themselves and, bet uh, 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 and in, in, Kurdo, uh, in southern Kurdofan, uh, rebels generally, because this is, seems to be like this thing that they keep, keep, keep talking about it. I would like to say some, one further word about popular movement. And how can, the, how can we help them? We, we are trying to look at the African Union, this and that, but I'd like to, look, to have a look at the rebel movement, people with the gun. How are they helping the, uh, the civil society movements? Look at the Sudan liberation movements when they came with the CBA and stuff like that. They never paid any attention to the question of democracy within Khartoum and within the north and in the totality of the country. Today, we have a kind of a revolving door. A movements coming, you know, there are four movements, especially they come, they agree with the dictator, and they split. Look at Dabajas, look at uh, Sisi, look at Minawis. They come, they make negotiations. Sometimes they say, okay, we would like to have the, uh, uh, the uh, governor of Khartoum. How are you going to help democracy when you when you're so determined that Khartoum is going to be yours? And what about three, five million people in Khartoum who would like to vote for someone irrespective? Is it, is it that foreign or anything? So these kind of deals and quotas that the that the that the, that these movements and splitting movements do with the regime, they perpetuate this regime. Uh, and so they need to think about how they are going to conjoin the cause for democracy and genuine democracy, and how to pursue their uh, military tactics. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, First of all, about the issue of uh, justice and the ICC. Actually, there were crimes actually even before the ICC come into being, you know, in Sudan. There is no question about that. And the ICC actually came just after 2007 or something, and the conflict has been since 2007 or, or something. Uh, but, but, you know, in Sudan, we have, you know, to know this. We are not in a post-conflict situation, and we are not in a post-unicide actually situation. And it's still the political leader, uh, leadership of the country it still is a state of denial and deception. Because right now they are denying that, you know, there have been crimes or something. And the crimes are going on. As we speak, actually, the crimes are, you know, continuing actually on the ground. So the issue of justice, I think, is very, very important issue and cannot be compromised. And I think when you want to talk about the issue of justice, also you need to bring the victims and survivors. And all we are talking about here about the international crimes. We are talking about genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And those, all these kind of crimes with international jurisdiction, so there is no amnesty or any kind of immunity actually regarding them. Uh, you know, I have different, you know, kind of opinions, uh, Ambika and the others, and I think, or should I reply to them because they are talking about those who committed crime because of political violence or something, shouldn't be tried or something, and I think that's wrong, wrong. I think it's not going to be in Sudan. So in Sudan right now, if you need actually to have a stability, and peaceful that actually recognized uh, by the others and put all the people actually on the ground on, on this peace process, you need actually to, uh, to recognize the issue of justice and to, embr to, to, to embrace justice. You know, about this uh, incremental political processes, you know, I myself, I don't agree, you know, with this kind of, you know, processes. You need some sort of comprehensive, you know, kind of process. But actually, you see, you know, the, the approach of the regime itself, the regime seemed to be very tempted for this kind of incremental, you know, because they don't want to discuss all the issues together. And even the regional community and in the international community, so that, that, that the thing. But what, what, what I say is there is legitimate kind of, you know, concern right now, whether in Darfur, or South Kurdufan, or Bulunay need to be, you know, to be recognized and to be embraced. And right now, I guess I want to tell you that the Sudanese society is so divided. 
you know, if you talk about people in Khartoum or other places or something, we need actually some sort of price of reconciliation. We need, you know, social healing. This is very important. Yeah, but right now, but right now, if you say that, you know, we don't accept the people of Darfur or they marginalize or they are armed struggle or something, well, you know, this is, didn't come you know, out of blue or something. It's because of the failure of the Sudanese state, which was so centralized and actually confined to very a small minority of the people or something. We need, you know, inclusive state. That's what we have to discuss on the national dialogue. National dialogue should that a process should bring together all the stakeholders to discuss the fundamental issues that actually led to the failure of the Sudanese state, this colonial Sudanese state. Issue of identity should be discussed. The issue of state and religion should be discussed. The issue of you know structural change of the country, which is to transform the entire country to a new country that embraces all its citizens. These are the issues which should be discussed. It shouldn't be about elite. It shouldn't be about political you know, parties or something. It should be all inclusive, serious kind of dialogue and a process to bring the people together. But first, we need also to address the issue of war and peace. These are some fundamental issues. And I think even President Bashir recognized it and in his speech or something like that. But we need all the elite. You know, to compare, you know, we ask all the elite actually from north or from different places, you know, to, to, to understand and to recognize actually the, the concern and the pain of the people of the mar mar margin is very, very important. But about the African Union, I don't think that the African Union experience, I was there, the African Union experience, whether in Darfur, in different places, actually was not a success at all. We know that the African Union is protecting the, their member of the club. We know that. I know that the African Union has very kind of developed you know, a uh, document or something, but they are not acting according to this kind of development or something. If you see what they do about the exposure of the crimes actually in Darfur, what they did about the, you know, uh, protecting the people actually, you know, on the ground, nothing actually. So what I see is the experience of the African Union is not, actually was not uh, a success at all. That's why we need, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, consortium or so some sort of forum can bring all those who are concerned about I the think, peace yeah, and security. Uh, maybe we need to discuss the, the question of, of uh, uh, the expectation of a regional player. John, do you have something to add? Well, just briefly on that, I think some of some of Ahmed's uh, observations are, are quite valid based on his experience. I do think that the AU has has evolved over recent years and is not what it was a decade ago. Uh, its intervention a decade ago, I think, did leave a lot to be desired. But I also want to go back to, to Dr. Abdullahi's point about uh, the rebels, because I think that's an important part of the conversation here. Um, and I think they really need to be tested in their avowed commitment to a peaceful process of change. Uh, they, they say at every turn that we, we prefer a peaceful process, we we'll continue the, the fighting, but we prefer a peaceful process. Well, I think we, the internationals and Sudanese, need to hold them to that, need to see how committed they are to that rhetoric. Um, now, we heard uh, Dr. Al Khatib uh, say everybody is invited. Uh, that's a big if. Uh, but if that really is the case, then I do hope that the rebel movements will participate. There's a lot of reason to be skeptical. There are some of those movements that don't participate in much of anything. Uh, and I think for that, they should be marginalized. Uh, but I hope that if this is the kind of process that, that we're hearing it is, and again, big if, need to underline that, then I really do hope that we're going to see uh, more significant political participation by the rebels than we have seen so far. Majdi? Yes? Are you with us? Oh, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> I, I, Do you have anything yeah, to comment? Yeah, I, I almost fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have two points to make. The first is, about again, about the African Union, because I wasn't talking in general terms about the African Union's involvement in Darfur. I was talking about the process that the, Af the African Union panel on Darfur did once upon a time. So this, this, this was the limits of my comment. The second, and this is about the rebel movements. I don't think we have political experience in Sudan has gone beyond the point where a gun should secure for the government or for an insurgent force automatic advantage over everybody else. And the, 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 the problem with the peacemaking that is, that is only centered around warring parties is that it guarantees some black bank advantage to people who have guns. And in that regard, the governments and the rebel movements play roles that are interchangeable because they move in and out of government. And this is the example of the SPLMN, for, for instance, which moved in and out of government. We've seen it as a, rebel, as, as a rebel movement, and we've seen it also as a governing force. It was part of the government. The same applies to Mini Manawi. We've seen the performance of Mini Manawi 
in government and in rebellion. So this revolving door between government and rebel should at some point be closed in favor of a popular door, because these are not the sole political actors in the country. Thank you. I have something for you guys to talk about, which is the election in 2015. And going back again to the big elephant in the room, Dr. Abdullah, you said that he would like to be in, in the office in 2015. And technically, he should not be running for election in 2015, as per the Constitution that is expiring in 2015. So what is the the thing that, let's say the national dialogue doesn't work, let's say that it's not fulfilling all the perception or all the aspiration that we think it should, should it should. How are we gonna deal with the election question? Okay, uh, and I think elections under this regime uh, gained a very bad reputation. Because as I said, it is not just an election, it is a safety valve, or <laughs> it is someone who would like to hide behind it. And uh, from, my, uh, from my experience of the last election, uh, the, the parties, or those running against the uh, NCB, uh, share or, uh, a lot of the blame. They really, uh, they were mostly on the side of complaining and not on the side of uh, doing positive things by, by really, if you say this is, this is forged, what, what, what evidence do you have? And I remember that a very, a young lad, a kid, in one of the remotest parts of Eastern Sudan used his uh, cell phone to document a forgery there and he took it to the highest court, and the highest court ruled that that was a forgery. The whole gamut of uh, 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 candidates and all those being have no, have had no uh, 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 evidence. It's just talk, no uh, real evidence that is presentable before a court. And as a such, they started to be very, uh, uh, very phobic about elections. And so it is not, uh, it's not, a, a, it's, it's not a, a possibility now. It is not a venue. Uh, people are talking about boycotting it if it is not like if 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 the government does not dismantle itself. So the government is not going to dismantle itself. Uh, they are going to run if there is a, a, a kind of a transitionary government or something something like that. So uh, it is going to create. Uh, it is not the kind of uh, thing that you, you, you would, you know, elections, sup supposedly elections are, are you know, cure all ills in all societies, <laughs> but not in Sudan with the specific conditions we have. So we really need to think of uh, uh, an alternative way of doing it or postponing it at a time when you say confidence is being built or something like that. Okay, well, from what we understood that the government is not willing to postpone it and, and because as you say they need it <laughs> not because there is any wisdom in that they need elections fast to give this guy and their party another uh, buying time <laughs> uh, what about the constitution uh, what is the political uh, the legal framework for that if if the constitution become it expires in 2015 could I have a question to ask again? For you, both of you. What is the problem with the constitution that we have? I heard the very expert lawyer say, why don't we work on what we have? Well, uh, that is a very uh, good question. And I think uh, having uh, a, a constitution uh, that is owned uh, by the people uh, is an important uh, thing in any uh, national uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, the current constitution uh, is uh, one of, uh, of, uh, of the best constitutions in Africa uh, in terms of uh, defining uh, the Sudanese state, uh, in terms of uh, human rights, fundamental human rights. There are some uh, issues that should be added actually, but it is one of the uh, 
uh, best uh, constitutions uh, when it comes to uh, it, its bill of rights as well. Uh, maybe we need to uh, think about uh, the form of government in the current constitution. It speaks uh, about uh, uh, a system of government uh, that is not clearly a federal uh, system of government. Uh, and at the same time, it is uh, a decentralized uh, system of government, but it doesn't speak about uh, federalism uh, p uh, properly. So maybe we need to maintain uh, some parts of the Constitution, especially when it comes to the, uh, to the definition of the Sudanese state. It uh, recognizes that Sudan is a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious uh, uh, state, a multicultural state, and this is uh, good. Maybe we need, in especially when it comes to this part, uh, that to add uh, that uh, maybe some uh, Sudanese uh, languages should be uh, recognized as uh, official or national languages. That is one Do thing. Think that this can be uh, dealt with maybe in, 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 in the first uh, part of the Constitution or in the, uh, uh, in the part that deals with fundamental uh, freedoms or and rights. Do you think the, the, the question of the Constitution can be done independent mm -hmm. from the dialogue or it, it should be part of the dialogue? Because I feel like it, it has its own well, urgency. A proper uh, national uh, dialogue process uh, should have uh, committees or commissions technical committees that should uh, uh, should be tasked with dealing with certain uh, issues, certain uh, problems. And I think there should be uh, a committee that uh, should draft uh, or re, uh, revise the current uh, constitution uh, so that it could uh, include issues that uh, are not uh, actually addressed uh, properly by the constitution, especially when it comes to, uh, to the form of government. I participated in, uh, in a series of uh, workshops uh, in 2012, uh, that uh, took me to uh, Western Sudan, to uh, Eastern Sudan, to Central Sudan, and uh, indeed in Khartoum we organized a, 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 a two or a three day actually workshop uh, that spoke about the issues that should be uh, included in the constitution, the current constitution, uh, that should be the permanent uh, constitution of Sudan. And one of the issues that uh, was actually uh, raised uh, repeatedly by uh, participants uh, was the issue of uh, federalism. People want uh, a federal, a genuine federal of government. Uh, this will par partially address the issue of governance in Sudan. Thank you. John, I have a question for you. Uh, do you think it's necessary for President Bashir to step down for these reforms to be viable? I think you asked the wrong panelists. <laughs> well, it was I, online. <laughs> well, it's it, no, it's it's a very good question, but I don't think it's a it's a question for for me, the only <laughs> non-Sudanese person here, to answer. Um, but but I do think that uh, a political transition needs to be part of the conversation here, um, and I do think that that President Bashir's future is a part of the conversation here, and it get, gets back to the elephant in the room. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you raised that elephant because it really does exist. And what is his political future? What is his personal future? Um, these have to be part of the dialogue, and that has to happen both within Sudan, but it's also a larger international community question because of the involvement of the ICC. Um, and I think there's a lot of good arguments on either side of the equation, but if there is a conversation about uh, a transition in power and about somebody other than President Bashir leading this country, then there also needs to be a conversation about where is he going to go and what does his future hold. Uh, and you know, both of those things are very much related to each other, and you can't just talk about one without talking about the other. Thank you. Anyone has a take on that? The issue on the Constitution, I think, uh, expired already in July 2000. Okay. 11, that, that there is no question. So it's not going to expire in 2015. Because, if, because it was drafted and in, uh, or came into force actually in 2000, uh, Ju uh, I mean January 2005, and has been expired with the separation or independence of South Sudan. This is very important uh, information. But about the issue of elections, I think election also should be part of the national dialogue. Because from what I see is the national dialogue actually should produce some sort of interim or transitional kind of mechanism, including maybe transitional government, a transitional government of, of uh, main test, uh, actually task for, I mean, um, uh, I mean, um, uh, I, you know, uh, aims and objective actually is uh, 
maybe to create the environment for new election or something. I'm not talking about the election that to be run or to be, you know, up the, you know, I guess organized by Bashir or something, because it's going to be new elections and actually it's going to leave the country in new chaos. That should be very, very important. About the Bashir fit, um, as I said, you know, it's um, uh, new transition, you know, it has to be established in the country. And, uh, and I don't think that, you know, with all he has done and I'm still doing, you know, he can be part of any kind of new transition or nation building process. This is, uh, if we really need, you know, the country to heal, actually it wounds, and we really want to establish some sort of national reconciliation and meaningful kind of change of the country, I think it shouldn't be part of any kind of transition. Great. Uh, we'll take Majdi. Majdi? Oh, hello. Um, yes, I'm not going to let you sleep today. This is this. This will be my final comment, and then I'll have to go leave it here. I'm afraid. Okay. Um, the, the presidents in Sudan generally don't leave by themselves. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this this would be extraordinary if he just stepped down. And the expectation that uh, an officer in power would step down for the general um, good of the nation is is a bit hyped. I'm afraid. And this brings us to the point that Abdullah raised about the balance of power. And, uh, and that's, in essence, what it's about. The balance of power right now does not allow for such a smooth transition. And um, the, ta the objective, maybe, is, is how to alter that balance in the favor of a more uh, national and uh, con in inclusive process, as has been discussed. But without this change in balance of power, this is unlikely to take place. Um, elections, in a sense, the government, as you rightly said, is very much interested in holding elections in time in 2015 with the clear objective of reinstating the president in his seat and keeping the NCP in the saddle, which is a, a valid thing to do if you're a ruling party. However, the technique of boycotting elections um, so cheaply is also not going to get the opposition anywhere. Elections are not only there to be won, they are also there to be fought and through fighting elections, you might win ground. And Abdullah himself has a bit of experience around this. And he has experienced immediately how this happens. But he was a standing, he was a man standing alone. I mean, of course, there was support around him, but um, in, there wasn't this, there wasn't a political, uh, uh, generous political organization around him. Uh, in the presence of that political organization, we might um, secure gains from elections by bringing people into the political stream. And you can see that also within the NCP. For instance, um, people like the governors of uh, Gadarif or Abdul Hamid Musakasha in South Darfur, they did quite a bit of agitation within NCP constraints um, that had a popular bend to it. Um, the notion would be how to bring more politics into the ground and not less. Thank you. And with this, I'll, I'll, I think I have to Thank you thank very much, much Majdi, for joining us. Okay. We, we have you. five minutes to go. So thank you so much for okay. Good Good being with us. A, a footnote here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Majdi said that yeah, uh, military rulers just don't go like that. Uh, but there is a kind of a, 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 an illusion in, 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 the, in the Sudanese elite mind that uh, President Aboud just resigned because people were like clamoring for his, and he said, okay, these people just don't like me. <laughs> I'm going to resign. And this was a lie. This is a lie. This is a hundred percent lie because Aboud was, was, t was, was driven by, by, by young officers. They climbed the wall <laughs> of the uh, Republican palace to tell him go and he was insisting till the last moment, and this was recorded then, at that time, by Cliff Thompson, a professor at Wisconsin, at Wisconsin University, who were uh, an eyewitness there. Uh, another just uh, footnote uh, by way of this metaphor of, uh, of uh, elephant in the room, I think uh, Bashir belongs to the army. Uh, people just wrongly assign him to the Muslim brothers. And people still believe that the Muslim brothers are in are, are, they are not. We have been barking the wrong tree for, for 25 years. The Muslim brothers dissolved their movement on day one, and they lost it until today, and these angry guys are trying to restore it. So 
I have two metaphors here. There is an elephant of the room that is the army <laughs> that we need really to address. And when we address not Bashir, when we address the armed forces as such, I think Bashir's position would be clarified. We, we should have ac ac actually addressed that point during the challenges because one of the, 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 the requirements for uh, protecting the reforms is having a professional army. To what extent do we have a professional army in Sudan? And, and to what extent the government is willing to have a professional army? And what about those rebels? Uh, how are you going to accommodate them within it the... A, it is a professional army, but an army that uh, got disassociated from the nation. Just like in Algeria, just like in Egypt, just like in Syria. This is an army that has a nation and not a nation that has an army. And 70% of the budget goes where? <laughs> Yeah. And who is going to guard and to uh, manage and to protect the 70% of the budget? True. Since we are wrapping up, I uh, would like to thank you all for joining us. And John, please get closing remarks. Well, let, let me thank you as well for, for being a wonderful host and, and thank our other panelists and thank our other uh, people who were kind enough to join us from around the world and, and stay up late on Skype. Uh, and also to thank some people who you don't see on the screen here, which is all the people who helped to make this production a reality. Um, they put a lot of work into this over the last few weeks that I've seen. This is the first time we've ever done anything like this at USIP, and uh, I think it seems like it's gone very well. look forward to watching it myself, and I think we'll probably be doing more of it. Um, particularly Arif Omer, uh, who's here behind the camera, a Sudanese fellow who we have here who it was his idea to do this uh, several months ago, and he has made this a reality, and so we, we thank him very much for this. Uh, and I think it's been a very fulfilling conversation. I hope it's the first of, of many on these really important national dialogue uh, conversations, and I hope we're going to see a, a genuine, participatory, inclusive national dialogue in Sudan in the near future. Inshallah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>